I'm going to go ahead and get things rolling. Uh, my name is Adrian Larson. I am president of Meridia Technology. I'm the guy who way back when uh, developed AccuGraph and kind of got the ball rolling. Joined by Kimberly Thompson, licensed acupuncturist. Hi, Kimberly. Hello. She is our resident acupuncture genius, takes care of a lot of clinical questions, uh, does some teaching for us, um, does writing for us, does a tremendous job. And so we're glad to have her here as well. Today, we're going to talk about what AccuGraph is doing when you're graphing somebody, uh, why it works. And so I've got a, got a little presentation we're going to walk through. Uh, we will take questions as we go, and we'll take questions at the end. So let's go ahead and get things started. Okay, here we go. I called this a non-boring look at what's really going on when you graph a patient. The reason I chose to call it that is because when you start getting into the physics and the electrical side of things, a lot of people's eyes kind of gloss over and really they just want a, a one or two sentence answer that they can give to their patient when their patient asks, well, so what are you measuring or how does this work or what are you doing or what are you testing? All the, vari all the variations of the questions that we all get asked by our patients. Um, so we're going to do this in a non-boring way, but we are going to teach you kind of the nuts and bolts of what's going on. And we're also going to teach the history of where this stuff came from, because that's another huge question we get asked all the time is, so who came up with this? So with that in place, let's go ahead and get rolling on it here. Um, the why of why we're doing this is because in the end, if you understand what's happening, you're not only going to be better at communicating with your patients, but you're going to be better at using the technology in your practice, which means you're going to get better results. You're going to be more successful. And that's what we're all about. That's why we're here. That's what we want for all of our customers. So part one of this presentation, we need to talk about the history and development of Rotoraku. Now, maybe some of you already know a fair bit about this. And if so, it's great, but I hope, uh, I hope I can add a few things to your knowledge. And I'm sure some of you are uh, brand new to this and have never really heard much about Raku. Well, the story starts with this gentleman, Dr. Yoshio Nakatani, medical doctor in Japan. When he was 27 years old in 1950, he was doing some medical experiments with patients that had nephritis. And, you know, nephritis affects the kidneys. It causes swelling in the ankles or edema. And he was actually measuring the electrical properties of the skin around the ankles to see what effect the edema was having. And he found a line going up the inside of the ankle that resembled the kidney meridian of Chinese medicine. And when you think about it, here he had these kidney patients with nephritis, and he had this line that looked like the kidney channel, and he put two and two together and said, wow, I wonder if these electrical alterations have something to do with this kidney meridian from Chinese medicine. So he uh, began studying that, researching it, and ultimately um, developed this, uh, whole, this whole approach to acupuncture. He found that all the lines that followed the classical Chinese acupuncture meridians were electrically different than the surrounding skin. And so he named these lines Raku. Japanese, it's literally line of good conductance or good electrically conductive line. So it's really a literal kind of a name, uh, literal kind of Japanese thinking about what he found. And so for the next, uh, you know, 30 years, he researched and developed, he taught, he treated thousands of patients, he refined the technique. In 1977, he published the definitive textbook on the subject. And of course, since that time, there have been a number of other books published. These are actually pictures of, uh, of a few that I've collected over the years uh, about this technique. And so that's the root, that's the basis of what you're doing when you practice this kind of acupuncture. And when people, people ask all the time, you know, well, who came up with this? And is this your idea? Uh, and the answer is no, it's, it's actually been around since 1950. And it's been um, widely used worldwide since then. Uh, there have been a lot of studies published. There have been a lot of books written. 
this isn't something that I just kind of came up with. Uh, we'll talk more about what I added to the field in a few minutes. But the other thing I want to point out is that Dr. Nakatani didn't come up with this. He just observed what was already going on um, and found out that traditional acupuncture theory and acupuncture thinking that had been around for thousands of years applied and could be measured. So really, Nakatani didn't come up with it either. He just observed it for the first time in this way. The method that he came up with called the Ryodoraku method, well, it's performed, as you know, by measuring the skin resistance at 24 points that represent the 12 meridians bilaterally. And eight of the 12 points were yuan source points in the model that he came up with originally. What that looks like is this. The original points he came up with are on the left and they're designated with H and F for hand and foot. Again, being very literal. So hand one, hand two, hand three, those corresponding over here to lung nine, pericardium seven, heart seven, and so on. You can see though, that some of his points were not the Yuan source points originally. He used some other points, Horary uh, point in one case, uh, Luo point, etc. He thought that those were a little bit better representation of the channel. Um, since that time though, things have kind of been modernized and standardized, and now it's all the Yuan source points that are used. This little gem is a neurometer and you can see it's a little, got a little dial there. It's got a scale of zero to 200. We'll talk a little bit more later about what the zero to 200 means. But this is one of the um, older instruments going back probably to the 1970s that people were using to do this kind of work. There's another one. These are some that I've collected over the years as well. You can see that there's all various types, but if you look, the one thing that they all have in common is they all have this dial, this gauge that goes from zero to 200. And so all of these different machines that have been come up with over the years, they are all doing the same thing. They're all taking the same measurement and various people have built various machines, but it's always the same. Here's a, here's a fun one. This is really the strangest one I've ever seen. Um, and it's got little lights in that bar there that go from zero to 200 little LED lights. It looks like a 1970s telephone or something. But uh, I have that one too. It's fun to pull out and play with. All of, these, all of these old devices still work. Here is a whole group of these devices all set up, ready for teaching a class. And here's the kicker. Looking at this, uh, when would you date it? Um, I mean, are you looking at a picture from the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, 90s? When do you think this took place? Having all this stuff like this ready for a class. I'll let you ponder that one for a minute. See if anybody has any guesses. All right, give up. This was... Uh, Last October. <laughs> I actually, last October, I, I traveled to Japan, um, went to the first International Federation of Rotoraku Acupuncture International Symposium. They've always just done a, a national symposium in Japan. Um, but when they opened it up to international attendees, I wanted to go. I turned out to be the only American that went. And uh, there I, I learned and watched and was taught by the masters, um, some well-known names, some people that have been doing Rodiraku for a lot of years, but I thought it was fascinating. Look at that device that he was using to measure me. It's the very same thing that I was showing you before, the same technology that's been in use for 20, 30, 40 years to perform these kinds of measurements. Ultimately, it's the same kind of technology that went all the way back to what Nakatani was doing in the 1950s. So I went to Japan, I watched, I learned, I'll show you a little bit more about that, but it was really interesting to watch these masters work and see these techniques the way that they were always done. Now, the traditional way that, that Rotoraku has always been done is that you would start by taking all of those 24 readings and you would plot the values on a paper chart. So you'd actually draw them and the chart looks like this. You can see that they've drawn the values on there and you can see down in the bottom left corner here, 
the little guide for reading the hand one, hand two, foot one, foot two, all of the Japanese stuff. This is the chart that Nakatani came up with. And it's still in use today for people that still do it on paper, like some of the folks I met in Japan. The chart is calibrated so that you can use a 1.4 centimeter wide ruler to represent the normal range. Here's what I mean by that. You would actually take a ruler and you would lay it down on the paper and you would move it up and down on that paper. You'd slide it up and down and try to cover up as many of the readings as you could. So you'd get it kind of right in the middle and have, you know, the same amount of readings above it and below it. And based on that, that's how you'd set your normal range. And then anything that was above the normal range, obviously, or below the normal range is something that you would treat. Only the bars that are outside that 1.4 centimeter range on the paper chart. So it looks like this. The ones that are above the range, well, they're excessive. They need to be treated with sedation. And the ones that are below are deficient. And this is how it was done, uh, you know, for 60 years. Well, 50 years anyway. Now, originally it was treated, you would, you would only treat the tonification and sedation points in traditional Ryodoraku. If things were low, you'd tonify. If things were high, you'd sedate. And you would treat using electrical current applied to needles. So you would actually insert a long needle and then you would touch an electrode to it to provide a current. Um, I'll show you some more pictures of what that looked like. Here I am at the, the Hokkaido University in Sapporo in Japan, heading to my conference the only American guy there. It was kind of fun. You saw this picture of me being measured, this picture being measured on my foot. Well, this is the treatment. As you can see, there's kind of this long needle there. And this needle was a good, I don't know, at least six inches long. And it was rather thick. Uh, a needle that long has to be kind of thick or else it'll just bend when you try to insert it. And then there's a long insertion tube. But the insertion tube is not as long as the needle. It's only as long as the needle shaft. But the handle portion, which is right up here, that protruded from the tube so that you could touch the electrode to it and provide an electric current. And so this gentleman that's treating me, he would go from point to point. He would insert the needle, touch the electrode to it, kind of plunge it in and out while it's shocking me, and then go to the next point, plunge the needle in again, do the same thing over and over. And that was how he went around and treated the points that were indicated by my graph. So here he is doing it on my face. On my face, he didn't use the same uh, long needle. He used a star needle with five needles, five small needles in a cluster that were non-penetrating, thankfully, because he did a bunch of points on my face. Don't think I wanted that six inch needle in my face in that many spots. Hey, Adrian. What, yeah. are you, what are you holding in your hand right there? Oh, I'm holding the ground bar because he's got to complete the electrical circuit. So just like when you graph a patient and they hold the ground bar in their hand, uh, when you treat them or when you treat someone electrically, you have to do the same thing. Gotcha. Thanks for asking. So here he is. He's treating some points on my abdomen. And then just for good measure, treated some points on my back. He treated quite a bit of stuff. And... Uh, it was, it was interesting. I learned a lot. By the way, I wanted to show you this while we're on the topic of Japan before we move on to the next topic. If you take a look here, this is the Japanese kind of the more modern version. Instead of having the old analog meter, this actually connects to the computer. You can see it's got a, a serial port. Is anybody in the, uh, in the webinar um, old enough to remember what a serial port is? Uh, so it's kind of old school, hooks to the computer, uh, runs under Windows, and then it would give you a chart that looks like this. And if you'll notice, that chart is identical to what you would see on the piece of paper. It literally just took the paper and made it electronic and put it on a computer screen. And there's my graph. If you look up in the corner there, Adrian, there's my name. And so they graphed me with their, uh, with their kind of modern computerized equipment. After a while, they got interested and wanted to know what I used. And so I showed them AccuGraph and that was that was really fun um, because, you know, most of the folks there had never seen anything like that. And uh, needless to say, some folks were quite surprised by what they saw. So some of the modern updates to Ryota Raku that I talked about uh, standardizing on the Yuan source points 
and also addressing splits. A split is where there's a left-right imbalance. So not only would you address things that are above or below the graph, but you would also look at things that are too different. So for example, here, if you look at F1 on this, uh, this graph I'm showing, you can see that the right side reads quite a bit higher than the left side. And the modern interpretation says that that left-right imbalance needs to be addressed. And so uh, that's some of the differences between the old original Japanese method and some of the developments that have come along. Okay, this brings us up to part two, where we're going to talk about what AccuGraph has done and how AccuGraph has kind of changed graphing and changed the field. But I wanted you to have the history so you'd know where this stuff came from. I realize that this is not taught in acupuncture school um, and that uh, for a lot of people, this is just, you know, utterly a mystery. What you got, Kimberly? So I was just thinking before you move on to part two, as um, I'm always fascinated when I'm learning this stuff from you, um, because I get into the day to day. But when we get into the history, it's been many years since I remember sitting in a class where you taught um, my first AccuGraph training, where I sat and you had all of the old devices out for people to practice and play with. And when you first put up that picture, I was thinking, oh, that's when he taught the class and showing the old pieces of equipment, which indeed is old pieces of equipment being used back in Japan right now, which I thought was interesting. Um, I also thought that it was interesting on how far we've progressed in that originally when, um, when they did the analysis that the tonification and sedation point were the only points treated. And now we've expanded, like the, the original expansion into modern science was Nakatani to begin with. He recognized that acupuncture points could be measured. And so we've stepped on from ancient Chinese medicine to modern Chinese medicine, which doesn't take away from ancient Chinese medicine, it just validates it. The other thing that came to my mind is why aren't they teaching this in school? Because when I was in college, I never learned the advancements of modern science. Although you learn modern treatment approaches with microcurrent and all types of things, but to show the validation that these points were actually measured, I think that's just an aha moment that we're not being taught that in school. Thank you for teaching it to the world. And then, um, and then to watch from there, what we, what has, the progression that I've seen in the last seven years since I've been working for Meridia Technology, recognizing that there are more points that we can treat besides the tonification and sedation point, which was the basis you know, figured out in the 1970s, and that there are more devices that can be used besides um, treatment. And then, of course, I'm sure you're going into where how far AccuGraph has come in the time since since your development and where it's going now. But anyway, I just wanted to make those points known. And my big question is, why aren't they teaching this in college? <laughs> well, thanks. And, you know, those are great points. Uh, one of the really unique things about Japanese culture is uh, deference to tradition, a great deal of respect for tradition. Uh, and things don't change very quickly. And so what's interesting is, you know, not only has Ryota Raku not really changed much since, Nakatani first developed it. But the other thing that, that you have to think about is in, the, in a larger sense, what we call TCM, traditional Chinese medicine, is post-communist revolution, Chairman Mao inspired, an, an amalgamation of multiple types of um, treatments. You know, that you, you take herbalism, you take uh, Qigong, you take Twina, you take acupuncture, you put it all together and you call it this ball called traditional Chinese medicine. But anciently, they were all practiced separately. These were separate disciplines. In Japan, they're so traditional that these are separate disciplines. An acupuncturist in Japan is not likely to give you herbs, but they focus on acupuncture from the traditional energetic perspective, not from the herbal perspective. And that's kind of the, the, the root or the genesis of Rotoraku is looking at the energetics of the meridians rather than uh, an herbal kind of a construct like you have dampness or you have phlegm or you have heat. Those are herbal. And so, yeah, Japan's really traditional that way. And that's kind of cool. So, I, and I know you're moving forward. I'm just excited to live in this generation now where we can take all of this 
ancient wisdom and take modern technology and how the medicine has progressed up to this point. It's kind of fun to be at that cusp in part of that generation. Yeah, yeah, uh, I, I agree. Let's talk about uh, you know what AccuGraph is and what it's brought to the table. So <laughs> here's a picture. Um, this is Dr. Dennis Baker. I don't I don't know if he knows I'm using this old picture, but this picture was uh, a picture I snapped in his office. And this is the desk in his old office before a tornado tore it down in St. Louis, Missouri, where uh, he graphed my daughter. And he graphed my daughter using that piece of equipment there on the desk, an old meter. And my daughter was a newborn baby and couldn't sleep. And we were having a lot of trouble with her. And so um, I found out he, he taught me about Rotoraku. And I said, wow, can you use that on babies? And he said, yeah, come on over to my office. I'll help you out. So we went over to see him. He graphed my daughter right there in that room. And um, that's where the conversation started. And I said, wow, this is really cool. It needs to be computerized. And he agreed and said, yeah, if somebody would do that, uh, I think that it really helped the profession. I think it would uh, sell. And I said, well, I'll do it. And so if you notice, if you look carefully at this picture, if you look down below the desk on top of the computer, you can see there's an AccuGraph there. And on his desk is an old AccuGraph box because I took this picture after we had built AccuGraph and he got one of the first units we ever built, of course, because he was one of the guys that helped us build it. And there I am, <laughs> this is embarrassment day. This is me uh, with the first AccuGraph unit being shipped out to a customer in 2003. And uh, there I am at my house in St. Louis, shipping it out. Go ahead, Kimberly, what do you have to say? That is classic. I am so glad that you captured that moment in time because you are a part of history. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the baby. Yeah, <laughs> Look at that sweet cell phone hanging off my, my pocket right there, huh? Exactly. Oh yeah. All right. Well, let's just uh, let's just move on from that moment in time. Uh, this is my kitchen table in St. Louis, Missouri, uh, putting together and shipping out some of the very first units that were ever built. So you could really say it was a home based business back then because it was. Well, take a look at this blast from the past. This is one of the first prototype versions of AccuGraph that we built. This never went public because this was still under development, um, but it was getting close to finished. And this was the little window that it would pop up in on a Macintosh. And uh, that name up in the corner, Elliot Larson, that's actually my brother Kimball, who hates to be called Elliot, but that's his real name. And he was the programmer that programmed this stuff and still is. He's still working with us today. So uh, anyhow, this is what the very first graph looked like that we built in AccuGraph. So we know him as Kimball Larson. So when you the information about Kimball, that is the original Elliot Larson. That's right. If you call in for tech support and you get Kimball on the phone, that's the guy. Make sure you tell Elliot I said hi. Um, here is AccuGraph 1. This is the final version. This is the one we shipped. And you'd have a little window there that would show a little graph and then it would pop up over on the side your uh, your little treatment recommendations and you would have a basic or you would have a five elements treatment. And that was it. That was what it did. You got one kind of graph. You got two treatment options and uh, you could add notes to a graph. You see the little notes button there. So there's AccuGraph one. That's uh, that's a blast from the past. That's a good time right there. AccuGraph 2 came along, we added the ability to compare multiple graphs. That was huge because people wanted to see before and after, wanted to see treatment progression. And so uh, when AccuGraph 2 came along around 2005, we added that ability. We also added some new graph types. Uh, so for example, here is the by element graph where we grouped the meridians according to their elements. And we started to realize that when you have a computer, once you have the data, it's not written on a piece of paper. You can actually take that data and you can do things with it in the computer, display it in different ways. And so we started to take advantage of that capability and something that, uh, you know, Nakatani never had at his disposal. Um, we developed the, uh, uh, the ratio screen. It's the one on the right there. We developed that in AccuGraph 3. 
And then the pi score came along in AccuGraph 4. And by then, AccuGraph 4, which came out in 2010, so seven years ago, AccuGraph 4 looked like this. And by then, we had developed a number of different treatment approaches. We had developed a number of different graphs. We did things like being able to show a history, the IntelliGraph adjustments, which was uh, huge when we, when we studied uh, you know, 200,000 graphs and came up with what the adjustments needed to be so that you were comparing apples to apples all the time. And of course, AccuGraph 5, the current version that we all know and love. Um, don't you love how things progress? I'm just gonna run through that one more time here. This is nostalgia for me. So starting from this, the first version that we ever shipped and jumping ahead to this, Come on. One more. There it goes. All right. Well, part three, we're going to jump into electricity. Um, now that you got a little bit of history, now that you know how this developed and where it came from, let's talk about what's actually going on when you do a graph. And with the electricity stuff, I promise I'm going to make it fun and understandable. So don't worry if electricity is not your thing. I'd be curious for people to chime in and say which version of AccuGraph they uh, showed up in. I showed oh, up yeah. in four, seven years ago. That'd be great. So your first version was four, Kimberly, is that right? Yeah, I showed up just as AccuGraph four was um, being completed. And and so things that happened between the advancements from four to five, I was part of. Hmm, cool. Yeah, yeah, uh, type in the comments, people. Uh, Tell us what your first version of AccuGraph was, if you remember. Um, and then maybe after the webinar is over, Kimberly, you know, here's a little secret, everybody. Um, in our in our research lab in the other room where we, you know, mess with electrical things, uh, I have a drawer where I have my old, old, old laptop computer that I had when I developed AccuGraph, and it still has AccuGraph 1 on it. And uh, every now and then, I pull it out just for nostalgia's sake. I showed it to my kids about a year ago. I pulled it out and showed it to my kids. And they're like, oh, it's so old school. It's awesome. It's so retro. Anyway, still have that one. Call me sentimental. And let's see, we got folks saying uh, started on three, started on three, you're now using four, started on four. Kimberly showed up at four. Wait, you know, I need to put a another, comment in there. I just met a gentleman, had lunch with him yesterday, who was an original AccuGraph 1 user, and that was really fun to chat with him. I put a comment up there. I said I started with AccuGraph 0, 0.0. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so what does AccuGraph actually measure? All right. It measures resistance. But let's just go with that for a minute. Don't get too hung up on resistance. Resistance is just the opposition to the flow of current. If you're trying to get from point A to point B, resistance is how difficult it is for the electricity to get from point A to point B. Uh, you can walk down a hall pretty easily, but if you had to swim down the hall, it would be a little bit harder because there's resistance that you have to swim against. You're not measuring something that the body is producing or giving off. And this is one that I, I hear a lot. You know, I. People kind of, it's a mistaken idea, but it's a common idea that you're measuring something like the body's electricity. Oh, you're measuring the electricity your body makes. No, no, you're actually not. Your body does make electricity. And for example, when you go, uh, when you have an electrocardiogram and they, they put, you know, pads on your chest, they literally are measuring the electricity your heart produces. We're not doing that we're actually measuring how easily the electricity flows from point A to point B. So we are introducing electricity into the body and then measuring to see the other end, how easily it gets there. So something you need to know about that is that if the electricity flows really easily, if there's low resistance, then you're going to have a high reading on your graph. Because really, what we're expressing is the opposite of resistance. We're expressing conductance. I like to use it, um, let's suppose 
you have a tray and you have stacked on that tray a whole big old pile of apples. And you're walking down the hall and apples are falling off left and right. And by the time you get to the other end of the hallway, you only have some of the apples you started with. Well, the resistance is the expression of all the apples that fell off. The conductance is the apples that stayed on and actually arrived at the destination. So if you have a lot of electricity, if it flows really easily, if it all flows through, you're gonna have a high reading, close to 200 on the graph. If there's a lot of resistance and a lot of electricity gets lost along the way, you're gonna have a low reading. So ultimately you're expressing how much electricity got conducted. Um, hey, and, and Kimberly, you're gonna be my, uh, you're gonna be my audience member. Let me know, is that, is that clear so far? Yes, talk about the low and the high one more time. I'm taking notes over here actually. <laughs> so okay. On the graph, if, mm -hmm. you, if you have a really low reading on the graph, it means the resistance is very high. And what got through, the electricity that got through is very low. Very little can make it through that channel. If you have so a high red, reading, then red the graph on the flows graph, easily. What's that? There's, the red on the graph means that the small amount of electricity that I have introduced to the body is not moving very well. Am I getting that? It, or am I opposite? You're opposite. Red on the graph is a high reading. In fact, so let me do this. To make it easier, I'm just going to jump back a little bit to a graph. So we have this graph in front of us here. And let's talk nuts and bolts. Look at triple energizer there. Triple energizer is really low. So only a small amount of electricity made it through that channel. In other words, there's a lot of resistance in that channel and only, only a little bit can get through. But if you look at large intestine next to it, you can see that a lot got through, that that channel is flowing much more freely. So what you're really looking at is how much made it through. Does that make sense? Yep, thank you. Oh, thank you. I appreciate you serving as our audience member. And uh, meanwhile, Remember, if we have questions, uh, I'm glad to take questions too. So the next question that I wanna focus on is, oh great, so you looked at electricity, you can see how much electricity is getting through the channel. What does that mean to me? What does it mean clinically if electricity gets through a meridian easily? Well, the answer is that it correlates to the state of the chi in the channel. If electricity is flowing freely, then you have a high amount of chi. If electricity is not flowing freely, if it can't get through, if it's reading really low, it's stuck and it's blocked, then you have a low amount of available chi that's flowing and able to move. So it correlates really nicely and it is um, clinically really useful to know what the chi is doing. Now, when I teach classes, I like to put up a picture of an x-ray and I ask people, you know, look, look at this x-ray, what do you see? Do you see the bones? Everybody says, yeah, yeah, I see the bones. And the answer is no, no, you don't see bones on an x-ray. What you're actually seeing when you look at an x-ray is a shadow. So if I put my hand up here, right now you are seeing my hand. If I, make, if I take an x-ray of my hand, you'll see the shadow that the bones cast because they block the x-rays from getting to the x-ray film or x-ray plate. So you're seeing a shadow but the shadow is clinically useful. You can diagnose what's going on with my bones based on the shadow. How did you do that? Do what? You just created a shadow on the screen. I did? I didn't mean to. Hey, cool. That, that was like perfect timing. I don't know if anybody else saw it. I Am I the only one who saw it? That was really weird. <laughs> hey, we'll take it. So anyhow, okay, so oh, go ahead. So one statement that you made, the available chi in the channel really um, hit home in my understanding of looking at a graph. Somebody else, Shireen saw it too. Okay, so uh, we have to go back and look because it is classic. We'll watch the recording. Um, so if the graph is low, there's not a lot of available chi. Right. The chi is deficient in the channel. If the graph is high, 
there's a lot of excess available, excess chi in the channel. And so oftentimes when I'm analyzing a graph, I will explain to the patient that this channel doesn't have enough of what it needs and this channel has too much. And if you were looking at chi stagnation, if there's too much available chi in a channel and you were looking from a muscular point of view or um, too much chi in a channel to me says stagnation, um, there, I mean, there can be pain, there can be excess. You know, that's when I began to look at it from TCM, even though a graph analysis is not TCM, but it's the condition of the channel. Mm -hmm. Too much energy in the channel is just as much of the problem as too little energy in a channel. That's why we're looking for green. We don't, red is too much, blue is too little. And so I, I really like that analysis of the available amount of chi in the channel. I think it will help a lot of people understand better. Yeah, and that corresponds. Uh, thanks, Kimberly. Uh, you're you're absolutely right, and that corresponds well with Jared's question here, where Jared asked, "Does that mean that a low reading in a channel could correspond to areas of pain due to blocked chi?" Absolutely, yeah. If it's not getting through, you you could have symptoms along the channel. You could have symptoms in the organ system that that channel is associated with, and all the channels affect others. And the muscle channel. And the muscle, yeah, the muscular tendon, the muscle channel. And the, and the channels all affect the other channels, as you know, it's a web. And so, but yes, due to block chi, absolutely. Let me go ahead and uh, jump back into screen here. Keep those questions coming. So it correlates to the state of the chi in the channel, just like that x-ray correlates to what the bones are doing. You're not actually seeing the chi, but you're seeing a shadow of what the chi is doing. Now, People say, well, how much electricity are you using? And we get asked about safety, and if these, are, these are excellent questions. Electricity, the amount of electricity, in simple terms, is measured in amperes, or amps is the abbreviation, okay? A 60-watt light bulb uses about half an amp, at least here in the U.S., where we use 120 volts. Accugraph uses about 20 millionths of an amp or about 20 microamps. And so this little 20 with the little funny looking U, that's a, that's a mu, and that means micro. So 20 microamps is the amount of current that AccuGraph is using. It's an extremely tiny current, which is why most people can't feel it. It's subsensory, and why it's very safe that people use AccuGraph on, on children, people use it on the elderly. Uh, really, the only contraindication is you don't want to use it if someone has an implanted medical device like a pacemaker, because you don't want to be introducing electricity into the body when there's you know something that is electrically dependent going on. Not that it's particularly unsafe to do so with a current this small, but it's more out of an abundance of caution and that you don't want to be the one that gets blamed if you know somebody gets grafted and then three weeks later their pacemaker has a problem. Even though it's totally not related, you could get blamed for that. So that's the that's the answer about the amount of electricity it's extremely tiny i want to add one other thought here on the electrical stuff on the amount of electricity it's this in the old school stuff dr nakatani used 12 volts when he did measurements and in the new stuff we use about five volts um i don't want to get too hung up on what volts means other than to say the higher the voltage the more um, uncomfortable the electrical current can be. When you get a little electric shock, you know, like if it's winter and it's dry and you walk on the carpet and then you touch the doorknob and it shocks you, that is a very, very small amount of electricity, but it is an extremely high voltage and that's why it hurts. So it could have, it could be the same amount of electricity that AccuGraph uses, but instead of five volts, it's that same amount of electricity at 20,000 volts. And so you're going to get a shock off of it. Anyway, the upshot of all that is AccuGraph using only five volts means that, again, it's very subsensory. Patients don't tend to feel it. It's very comfortable. The old school stuff that was originally done by Nakatani was less comfortable. And of course, Nakatani did what was available to him because back in those days, they didn't have highly sensitive computer uh, electronics. They didn't have the ability that we have now. And so our electronics are many times more sensitive than anything he had access to. Okay, the next question. When you look at a graph, 
you notice that there's that zero to 200 scale over there. And so I've kind of given you a little close up of it here. Well, in the old school, they used 200 microamps. That was the amount of current that they would put through the meridian. And so that it just showed how much of it got through. If you remember my little analogy about you're carrying a big tray of apples, well, suppose you had 200 apples on the tray and you run down the hall holding this tray of apples and 100 of them fall off. And by when you get there at the other end of the hall, you've got 100 left. That's what the 200 scale is. It's how much of the electricity actually made it through. Well, since that was the standard, zero to 200 is what everybody's used and they've been doing it for 60 years. We stuck with that scale, even though we're not using 200 microamps. We simply um, calibrate it so that it, so that it appears the same way. We have to scale it up to, uh, to show on the 200 scale. But people say, well, you know, you're measuring 200 what? What is that? Is that 200 volts? Is that 200? And if I'm, if I'm <laughs> being serious with them, I give them the answer I just gave you. If I'm not being serious, if I'm joking, then I make up a really good one. Um, okay, so we still use the same scale. Current is much lower, but that's what the zero to 200, it represents microamps that are conducted. Why does it take, oh, go ahead, Kimberly, what's up? Okay, so I get the question often about when it hits 200 and it just sort of flats out at the top and, and you know it could go more. So the it will it will only measure to 200. I'm assuming if I had 400 apples on my platter that 400 would fall off when it's hitting that range or at least more than 200 would fall off. So what is your um, analysis on um, when it reaches the top of its potential? Sorry about that. When I switched to camera, I realized it cut you, it cut off voice for a minute, and I apologize. You said if I had 400 apples, pick it up from there. Okay. Uh, I would assume that if I had 400 apples, probably 400 would fall off because it's it's skyrocketing well above 200. Do you have an analysis of um, what's happening when it hits that top range and goes off the chart? or would go off the chart if there was more chart to go? <laughs> if there was more chart to go off of. Yeah, sure. I mean, there there's always a limit because there's always some amount of resistance. The only way where there's going to be zero resistance is if you actually take the probe and the ground bar and you touch them together. But you put a human body in there, you put a meridian in there, there's always going to be some resistance. If there's not a lot of resistance and it goes right to 200, all 200 apples make it through or all 200 microamps are getting through, then yeah, there's there's a possibility that if you could turn it up to 300, would 300 get through? At some point you would hit a limit. What we found is that the scale, the way that it's scaled now and the range that it'll measure is really good for 95% of the measurements out there. And if something's going to 200, it's usually due to a, a different factor than the meridian. Like for example, you've had the experience of measuring somebody who's really sweaty. Right. And it'll it'll go really high. That's because salt water on the skin is causing excess conductance, making the skin much more conductive than it would normally be. Um, or a, a break right. in the skin. Yeah. Scratch. So Sometimes if you, you don't measure that meridian there, you're going to have issues if you measure over where the skin is broken because it's going to, uh, when the skin is broken, the conductance is much higher. Thank you. I just get those types of questions. I thought this would be a good place to address them. I'm glad you're asking. Thank you. Why does it take three seconds when you do a, a measurement in AccuGraph? Well, it's kind of like if you have a ditch, uh, here, here where we live, we have these irrigation ditches and comes off the reservoir and we get irrigation water that, that then goes into a pump house and runs the sprinklers. And it's, it's great that we have this water available. But in the spring, we have to clean the ditches before the water comes through. Otherwise, when the water courses through, it picks up all of the stuff that's collected in the ditches over the winter and it can clog things up. Well, when you first run electricity through the channel, you kind of have to clear the ditch. And so the electricity, it starts out and it starts to get through there a little bit better and then it kind of hits a plateau. And in AccuGraph 5, there's this little picture that I've got up on the screen here where you can see the conductance and you see that when it first starts out, not much flows through, but as it flows, the ditch starts to get cleaned out and then it, then it goes up to its maximum flow and it levels off. Um, <laughs> the other analogy would be like clearing your throat. 
if you haven't talked in a while and you start to talk and there's some phlegm or something built up in your throat, your voice doesn't all get through. And then as you speak or as you clear your throat, then you get 100% through and you hit the maximum capacity of your voice. So that's why you read for two or three seconds. You want to give the readings a chance to stabilize. And showing that, showing that little chart there, showing the line increasing, I think is really helpful because then you can see how the patient's meridian, meridians are responding when you take a reading. And that's why we added that in AccuGraph 5. That was something that people really wanted to find out. I call it phantom resistance that starts out at the beginning when there's a lot of resistance and so the reading is really low. And then as the resistance subsides, it, it goes up and it hits the plateau. So here's a question that I get asked a lot. If I'm graphing somebody and they're, you know, patients are really fascinated. They love it when you graph and they're really interested. They're looking at the computer. They're hearing the tones. They're watching the number. And so you, you measure the first reading. And if it's a first timer, you'll get two or three readings in and they'll say, so is that good? Because something goes up, uh, you know, they say, hey, it's a 63. Oh, 63. That, that's good, right? And so my question here, what is a good reading? Now, those of you that are familiar with AccuGraph and that are experienced users, you already know the answer to this. A good reading depends on what the average is, what everything else is doing. So look at this graph that I've got up on the screen right now. Is 30 a good reading on this graph? No, 30 is not good because everything else is much higher than that. 30 is clearly low. What about 90? Is 90 a good reading on this graph? No, nope, 90 is clearly outside the normal range as well. It's an outlier. You're looking for balance between all the meridians. 90 would be a great reading if everything else read 90, but 90 is not a good reading on this graph. So when patients ask that question, so, hey, that's a 60, is that good? I say, it depends on if everything's 60. That might be perfect for you. And we'll find out as soon as we finish the graph. So it's all about balance. There isn't a set number that is the right number for anyone ever. Um, there, you know, I've, I've heard sometimes and even been taught in classes years ago that, oh no, you want everything to be a hundred. But the statistics don't bear that out. Everybody's different. You don't want to force someone to be a hundred. What you do want is someone to be balanced with themselves. Now let's talk about how you explain to patients. First of all, I think it's really important that you keep it simple when you explain. Um, I one time witnessed a, a practitioner um, and it was, it was kind of painful because the patient asked a, a pretty simple question, you know, so what are you measuring? And the practitioner launched into literally a 10 minute uh, lecture on physics and on electrical parameters and the patient was not interested. And unfortunately, this particular practitioner, great guy, but not a lot of social skills and just couldn't pick up the fact that the patient was not only bored, but actually repelled at this point. So I always give the simplest answer I can and let them follow up. But I do it in a friendly way. I don't want you to be scared of your patients asking you questions. And that's the point of the webinar today, so that you feel prepared to talk about this stuff and you don't have to be evasive or you don't have to ask the patient to call Dr. Larson. <laughs> yes, people do that. Um, you can answer it, but keep it simple. People say, so what are you measuring? I say, well, I'm measuring how well uh, the cheese moving in your channels or I'm measuring how well each channel is uh, conducting electricity or just even simpler. Oh, I'm just measuring your, uh, your acupuncture channels, your acupuncture meridians. Well, if they follow up and say, well, what are you measuring? Oh, I measure how well the electricity flows. Oh, well, what, is that? what does that show you? Well, that shows me how well the chi, the energy gets through each of your channels so it can do its job. I mean, you don't want that blocked up, right? And patients are all, oh, yeah, that makes perfect sense. That was really simple, really easy, and I didn't have to go too far. Now, how many of you have had that engineer that comes and <laughs> gets treated in your practice that wants to play 21 questions about the electrical parameters and about the physics of what's going on, hopefully you can at least answer the basic questions now. For example, somebody says, well, how much electricity are you using? Is this gonna shock me? No, no, it's an extremely tiny amount. 
it's measured in microamps. It's 20 millionths of an amp for those electrically inclined out there, those engineer types. And okay, great. I've never had somebody really go too far down the electrical rabbit hole. Um, just the basic questions really seem to satisfy everybody. And so that kind of brings me to my final question that I want to answer for you guys. And then I want to take your questions and answer them. But this is the question that I wish people would ask me. <laughs> what is the most important thing I've learned? Now, you've seen the history. You know, I was introduced to this stuff in 2002, developed it, began selling it in 2003. Uh, I've, I've studied this. I've, I've read the books. I've been to the seminars. I've traveled to, to go get trained by the originals. The thing that I've learned that honestly to me still fills me with awe and is still the most impressive thing of all is that this stuff works. Let me explain what I mean by that. Okay, what I mean by that is that when I first got introduced to this stuff, I took it all on faith. My instructors said, yeah, you know, you measure, you use the electrical parameters, you see how much current gets through, and that means that that's how the chi's flowing. And I said, okay, boss, sounds good to me. Chi, right, got it, chi. I took every bit of that on faith. Kind of like we all have to when we start learning about acupuncture, start learning about Chinese medicine. And we have those nagging questions. We say, well, how did these people 2,000 years ago, 3,000, 4,000 years ago, how did they know where these points were? Did they have x-ray vision? Oh, oh, no, it was battlefield wounds. Somebody got shot with an arrow. And no, I don't buy it. So you just kind of have to take this stuff on faith. Well, stuff you have to accept on faith and believe without evidence, that's kind of a religion. And so when I first started teaching this and selling this and developing this, it kind of felt like a religion. Not that that's a bad thing, but it always bothered me that I didn't have better evidence. Well, a few years back, we finally, we, we partnered up with a university. We did a huge study we analyzed a couple hundred thousand graphs. We did the statistical analysis and looked at the correlations. And the bottom line is we have the evidence. Um, we won first prize for that research. We didn't know we were in a research contest when we submitted the paper to be presented at a live symposium, a big international symposium. Uh, we won first prize uh, because no one had ever come up with the evidence before in a way that was so large and so well documented that it was undeniable. It's not something that you can just make up. It wasn't based on some kind of a subjective symptom improvement. It was all objective electrical measurements. So the most important thing I've learned, in my opinion, is that the meridians are real, folks. Chi is real. You see the effects every day in your practice. I see the effects electrically. I've measured it. I've done the science. And you're doing the science when you graph people. And that really makes me happy because I've always been the electrical nerd. And so feeling like we've hacked the human and come up with at least a rudimentary way to understand the human energy system, that to me is totally exciting. So I'm going to open it up to questions now. I'd like to know what you want to know about AccuGraph, how it works, clinical questions, whatever. You've got Kimberly here. You've got me as a backup. So <laughs> What uh, what kind of questions would you, would you like to ask? Go ahead and type them over here in the um, in the chat window, and we'll take a look. So while we're waiting for people to type in questions, I just want to say congratulations to you. What an honor to work with you. You were one of the key players in the progression of the history of traditional Chinese medicine, we've watched it. I mean, we hear about it 4,000 years ago. We hear about science that developed it back in the 70s. Um, and then your story and your progression. And then there's modern evidence and modern science. I wasn't that person who came in on faith and said, oh, yeah, let's just try this. I argued every step of the way. And does it really work? Does it not work? And, you know, maybe because of some of my arguments, we've come to more of a place where we're realizing that there are many, many ways to change a graph. And um, that's what I'm finding. 
um, through the medicine because I would get bored if I had to treat the same way every time in every circumstance and every person is different, but chi is not different. Chi moves and there are certain elements that move chi. And once we recognize all of those elements, then the world is so open to us. We have so many possibilities. So congratulations. Well, thanks. That's, that's kind of you. Um, I, and I got to agree with you hundred percent. Um, and Ben here asked a question. Thanks, Ben. Uh, what is the biggest clinical difference in five versus four? The biggest difference that I see is that you can custom build a treatment plan on the fly, not just based on here's what the graph recommends. Do you want it or not? But you can say, yeah, well, I want this and this part of it, but I want to change this point. I want to add these two other points and I want it all in the permanent record. And as fast as you click that, it's done. It gives you much more treatment flexibility because as Kimberly said, as we've grown and learned, we've learned that there's a lot of ways to change a graph, a lot of ways to get great results. And so instead of just having the blinders on and saying, no, no, graphing, 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 that's it. We've added a lot of abilities to adapt to the way that you treat. Of course, it's got all the record keeping. It's got tons of, of great clinical tools to help make your life easier. But to me, that's the gold one is that it lets you treat the way you want to treat. Which I begged for for so long, I wanted to be able to customize it to the way that I like to treat. The other thing I would like to say to Ben um, regarding his question, your ability to not just look at the acupuncture channel, which is on the surface, but to dig in deeper and look at how acupuncture channels are crossing based on musculoskeletal and internal pathways. And that's fantastic to be able to show your patient, to educate them, but to expand your mind and your thinking. And when you look at a deficiency in one channel and an excess in another, and you realize that all of those channels have internal pathways that cross the heart and no wonder this person has problem with sleeping or anxiety, or when you're looking at internal pathways and you recognize all of the channels that cross through the jaw and into the eyes. And maybe your patient has never talked to you about the jaw. And then when you go in and palpate, you find out how much tension they have in their jaw. So then, then you can take them to a whole new level. So the internal aspects of it give you a greater vision for um, deeper analysis of what's happening with the patient. Absolutely. Um, Alejandro asked, uh, he says, finally, today made up my mind for the upgrade to AccuGraph 5. Can I briefly have the five over four innovations? Thanks. And definitely it works. Love that, Alejandro. Thank you. Uh, briefly, and I don't want to, obviously, you can contact us and we'll, we'll give you a lot more info. But briefly, you've got better clinical things. We've already kind of addressed that. Better record keeping, better documentation, new home care and better home care options, including a vastly improved dietary component. Uh, where you can recommend diet, uh, better reports and printing, um, and a, a vastly improved panoply of treatment options. So how's that for a quick summary? Um, okay, Dr. Uh, Keith Susco, if you graph the patient two or three times in a row with no more than a few minutes between graphs, are the results consistent or does the electrical energy introduced during one graphing session change the results if you regraph immediately. Ding, 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 ding. You win the prize, Dr. Susco. Thank you for asking that because that is the most common question. Um, and I'm glad you asked it this way because sometimes we have people that they're new AccuGraph owners. They call us and they say, hey, I think my machine's broken. I just graphed and regraphed and the results are different. And the answer is no, the machine didn't change. You did because you're absolutely right, Dr. Susco. When you introduce electricity to the meridians, even the tiny amount that AccuGraph uses, it changes the channel. And so the subsequent graph, if you graph and then regraph right away, you'll find that you have introduced, you know, in, in physics terms, you've introduced an ionic gradient in the skin that is going to change the electrical parameters temporarily. So the upshot is we always tell people the first graph is the correct one. Don't go back and try to regraph and, and you know, five minutes later and use that graph because you're going to have changes based on what you already did a minute ago. Similarly, if you graph somebody and then treat them, when you treat people, when you put needles in or laser or electric, whatever you're doing, you're moving chi. And not just in the channel that you treat, but in all the other channels of the body. 
And so I tell people, once you treat a patient, give it 24 to 48 hours and let it settle. See where it's going to go. Because you've started a chain reaction of dominoes that are still falling. And so if you treat somebody and then graph them right away, you're not seeing the results of the treatment. You're seeing the beginning of the treatment. Make sense? Okay. Um, last chance. Any other questions anybody wants to throw out? While we're waiting for anybody that wants to, to type a question, I just want to say, uh, keep in mind as an AccuGraph owner, we're here for you. We are always glad to answer your questions. You're welcome to call us. You're welcome to email us. You can contact us at service at AccuGraph.com and those will get through. Um, we really want to take good care of our AccuGraph family. And so please don't ever feel like we're more than a phone call away. Kimberly? And if you're an AccuGraph 5 user, you're part of our uh, Facebook user forum. And we are always posting case studies and questions. And then we've got an array of other practitioners who are willing to help analyze what's going on with your patient. Yeah. Yeah. The Facebook group, the AccuGraph user group on Facebook, you do have to be a five user to, to be in that group, but it's an active community. There's people there. You can ask questions, you can post graphs and get input and it happens a lot. So thanks to everyone who participates. For those who aren't participating, come on, join us. Okay. Well, welcome. I mean, not welcome, but thank you, everybody. I appreciate uh, everybody joining us today. We look forward to seeing you over in the user group, and we look forward to seeing you at next month's webinar. And with that, we will call it a day. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.